if you all could take a moment and think back in your memory, what's the first fiction version of a voice assistant that you can think of or that you have a fondness for? For me, it's Kit from My Writer. As a child of the 80s, and for those of you who don't know, uh, because you're of a newer generation, uh, Kit was a voice assistant loaded in a car whose mission was to save people's lives and help with people in need. Um, but to me, it was like this com perfect combination of physical and digital design. Um, and it inspired me to get into technology and design and figure out a way to start to create this uh, in my world. Delayed click. All right. And so we started to do some of this. Uh, I worked for Comcast as a creative director there. Uh, and about around 2014, 2015, we came out with our voice remote. Uh, this is our second generation here. Uh, we've deployed over 20 million devices in the home with 9 million utterances. And then for those of you who don't know uh, what Xfinity is, because this is a global audience, but it would be worth showing you guys for a second just what that UI looks like. Uh, so if we were to zoom in on our interface here, uh, and you wanted to continue watching your favorite episode, uh, that's a great showcase of the city of Philadelphia, uh, you might say, uh, continue watching, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. And you go right in there and continue watching right where you left off with Mac and the gang. Uh, and this is a, a great, powerful thing. Uh, it's taking personalization, uh, your watch history, combining that into something that's really tailor-made for you uh, in your household. Uh, and I don't really need to argue with this audience about the value of voice over other modalities in order to uh, reach the content that you need. It's clearly faster, it takes less effort than anything else we have, at least today. Uh, but we're all kind of struggling of what to do next uh, for Xfinity and the other devices as well. Uh, things beyond factual questions or uh, direct retrieval, the, the usage kind of drops. Uh, the experience of our users tends to fail. Um, and I think this kind of goes back to uh, an evolutionary thing. If we look at over human time, we've been communicating with each other through spoken language for over 100,000 years. It's only been in the last 100 or so years where we started to have that human-to-computer interaction. First with typewriters, type uh, then with computers and mice, eventually with, with voice control. And it's been a great addition, but I think the voice that we've been delivering is not that human-to-human -human interaction, but more of that human-to-computer interaction. And you know, even though the language of those cave people were probably a very uh, rudimentary to today's standards, there was a lot more feedback that they were able to get through uh, the emotion that that person conveyed, you know, through the, their, their eyes and their attention and their gaze. And so I think we've been delivering on this kind of sub level of language. Why am I a lamb? Cream cheese is cheese? Wait, it, do you still want to know? Avocado pit huge, why? Okay, don't speak in these weird haikus. Okay, so a little out of sync and my click was a little off. But what I was trying to illustrate there was that we're building on this version of language that really people were starting to use with Google and, and searching in general. And we're kind of continuing that forward and creating this kind of weird haiku driven language. And if you were to look at uh, us in the future, the, the language that we're creating might not be what we're used to seeing today, and it might look like something you know, pretty foreign to us, but slightly familiar. And so that leads me to the, the conversational design paradox. I'm reminded of this book, uh, The Paradox of Choice by Barry Schwartz, where he talked about by giving our users uh, a lot of options, we're actually creating some paralyzation. Uh, and if we were to reduce those, uh, those options, we would actually have a better experience. And I'm not saying that we need to reduce voice modality is far from it. I think it's you know, beneficial for all the reasons you probably agree with. Uh, but I think when you say something has a voice interface in it, people are thinking of that evolutionary aspect of voice when the systems, at least today, are not delivering on that. And so my challenge to all of us is how do, you know, let's start to push, how do we push, to, uh, to push our design systems and our voice conversations further to achieve that. Because I think when you look at how people are using voice today, uh, they're frustrated. 
Um, this is uh, near all's hook and uh, DJ BJ Fogg's behavior model. They're getting that trigger, they're taking that action, but the reward often falls. And similarly, it's both hard, and then they lack the motivation, so they're not succeeding with their triggers. And I get why we are where we are. We're all under this pressure cooker to be better than another, to get things released to market faster than one another. We're looking at our analytics and seeing uh, certain usage behaviors and kind of delivering on those. But we're, the, the things that only work are those kind of fractured haikus of conversation. And thus, we're kind of just in this iterative cycle uh, you know, because of that, uh, and not actually looking at the larger you know, framework of what a conversation should be. Um, so some things that I want to kind of illustrate that I think would be helpful to, as designers, we could work on. Uh, you know, designers are very empathy driven, where we got the, the voice of the, the customer. We should also take that to foster relationships with people uh, inside our organizations and, uh, and across our teams. It's not just something that design can handle. We need engineering, we need product, we need copywriters, we need technologists. We need all these different voices to come together and kind of craft that North Star vision. You know, what, what is that Knight Rider vision of what this conversation should be? And then optimize and iterate towards that vision and continue to, to refine it. Um, missed my click again. Uh, and then, so it's, the, it's okay to be the master of one thing and not the master of everything, right? Like Alexa is trying to cover why, but it, is it really going deep? Uh, there's certain voice assistants that are trying to go deep. Uh, this is the UI from uh, Tesla's interface. Uh, it's probably, arguably, the closest to that vision that I had as a kid as far as like an autonomous, intelligent vehicle. Uh, so you'd expect it to be pretty, pretty deep on being able to control a car, but the only thing that it's able to do is actually uh, navigate directions or uh, play certain music. So it's really uh, quite a ways away from where it should be. Uh, and that was supposed to talk about <laughs> the, uh, so we, we often talk about our, our remotes as being uh, the brand in your hand. And w as we look at the, the voice button, we, we talk about how can this button and this experience kind of convey the same type of feelings and, uh, and emotions that talking to uh, a friend could. So what can you do in your experiences and what should you be doing through lighting, through iconography, through, through text help, from haptics, from ear cons, to ensure that the experience that our users get from our devices are as close to being a human as possible to help foster that relationship. And it's not only about uh, us expressing our, our emotions to the user, but also being able to read the user as well. In order to foster that human to computer bond, uh, I'm not saying we need to have like cameras or biometric sensors in there, but even just the intuition or the, the tone of someone's voice, uh, are they frustrated, are they happy, are they angry, and adapting that conversation starts to build that level of personalization and humanness that people are starting to look for. Because w without that, people aren't going to build trust and they're not going to have confidence with our systems. It's essentially today like we're having a conversation with Dory. The last five years, dealing, talking to uh, our devices, they don't know us any better than they did five years ago and f or from day to day. So how do we really push that personalization layer into our products? And I think this also comes down to changing the way how we design. Uh, it, it's not about a traditional IVR flow. It's not about any flows in general. As designers, we need to look at the whole system and design patterns and templates that can be dynamically used uh, to support these different use cases. For instance, how do you deliver on an experience where someone says, oh, I, I want to watch the latest action movies, but I don't like uh, Tom Cruise. How can we look at your viewing habits and, and your, the things you like and don't like to help recommend with a high success rate that you might like something like John Wick? And as we guide people through the interface, we need to be certain that we're not overwhelming them. Uh, a UI with all these buttons and texts uh, is, is, is a lot to process. When you kind of load that page for the first time, you're, you're reading that and you're ingesting that. As they start to in, engage with voice, you need to be sure that we're not constantly changing that. We, how do we complement that experience and not you know, go full screen? For our product, we've dedicated uh, a, an area of real estate in the upper left that has a, a guaranteed area where the user can always look. And that's shown in our testing to 
to have a better experience for continuing voice conversations. And, and teach them a better way. You know, if you see a friend getting lost somewhere and is confused, uh, wouldn't you help them? Or if you knew that there was a better way to do something, how do you go about educating them? So if it took me 30 clicks to play that episode or that movie like Pulp Fiction, could we then tell them next time, hey, next time try using your voice and here's a command to let you do that. And even failures are great learning opportunities for us. Uh, I constantly have this issue with my family where I, I try to use drop-in to wake up my, sis my daughter, and I always say, uh, wake up Sarah, or drop-in on Sarah, but the device is always uh, Sarah's room. Uh, and it, it never fixes itself, I never fix myself, and really there's an easy interaction there to fix and to put the onus on the device to do it. And then prototyping. I know we all kind of talk about this a lot, uh, but it's really important to, to express here. Get out in front of your customers as much as you can and constantly think to yourselves every day, have I done all I can to get this to my users before cutting tools for, for equipment or doing hard coding for engineering efforts? And then lastly, you know, my vision of when I was a child was of Knight Rider. As uh, we are experiencing this today, our kids are, are, are having this broken experience or this challenging experience with our devices. Uh, and my family, and I'm sure all our families, are experiencing this, uh, this uh, happen when we bring home our devices that are uh, in prototype form, right? So they're experiencing errors more prone than anyone. And in fact, it's so prone sometimes, you know, as we iterate, and that's part of the process, uh, that m my wife sometimes is the harshest critic about voice. Uh, so with all the things that I've been talking about, I, I really think if we go more uh, further on delivering personalization and kind of guiding our users along this way, the way, we'll go uh, to a much better place in kind of crafting the experience that people want to engage with and build the voice feature that we want for, their, for our customers. Thank you.